Let's start. So we're 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 recording now. Okay. So uh, could you start out by telling me your full name and spelling it? My full name is Andrew Clarkson. It is spelled I T. Uh, uh, my name is spelled Andrew. <laughs> A N D R E W C L A R K S O N. What's that? Good? Yeah, but I just don't let him talk into the camera. Right, so. So you want me to talk? Where, where do you want me to focus well, it? Is it? He should look at me, right? Yeah. Okay. So just, just cool. talk to me. Yeah. No, it's like. It, can you lower down? Like, because. I can. He's like, he's like talking in the camera, like, ah, ah, ah. Oh, yeah. All right. So. Uh, I can also just look at a position. I mean, I can just stare at a particular thing if you want me to look at, like, tell me where I'm looking right now. Is that fine? He's a great subject. Yeah. Uh, Still too close to the camera? Just, how about if he just looks at me right here? Is yeah. That yeah. Yeah? Yeah. It's working. Yeah. Right. She's, she's a lot more professional than I am. She's, she has and, more. yeah, it's you not professional. <laughs> She's got she's got real world video experience. And awesome. She's got fucking around in class video experience. No, I'm I'm also just walking on <laughs> <laughs> classic. I who told you I got real world video experience? I just assumed, I guess. No, I you don't have them. I'm the why, same as you. <laughs> this is why you shouldn't assume stuff. That's I've heard that. All right, man. So that. how long ago did you start Rossum? Uh, conceptually about a year and a half, maybe a little more, but in reality about a year ago, um, is when we really decided this is a business, not a hobby or a fad or, or something fun to waste time on. All right. And how did you, how did you come to be working with David? Uh, David approached me, uh, I guess through mutual friend and, uh, some conversations we talked about what I did and what I was doing and. He was just excited and interested at the moment to hear more about the project and the more we just discussed and kind of got into the nitty gritty, if you will, the more there was a lot of opportunity for a partner to come on and I decided right away that I did not want a company. The plan was not to formalize this in any capacity. It was a fun hobby and we were going to leave it at that. And um, However, when David came into play and we started talking about what could be um, and we really saw a lot of potential and the opportunity just kind of popped up to formalize, turn it into a, a legit business instead of just a fun project. And uh, so that's kind of how we came to be, if you will. So what, I mean, um, how do I want to phrase? All right. So we asked David if you're motivated by money and he said, no, he doesn't think that you are. So what, what motivates you? Like, why do you, why do you do this? Um, I don't have a complete answer for you. I think everybody's searching for why they do what they do. Uh, but for me personally, uh, destroying boundaries and or expanding boundaries around me have always been fun. Um, and once I realized you can't live life just having fun, uh, people get mad at you, <laughs> especially when you like breaking down boundaries and things. So I realized I needed to be very effective uh, with what boundaries I was willing and interested in pushing. And I found that just uh, as an entrepreneur from a young age, I wanted to change individual problems, things that were tangible that I could touch um, and know that the people I was impacting were actually impacted in the way that I thought they were and that they were happy with the whole system. And just uh, for me, that's very important with what I do. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that what drives me most is the fact that in this particular realm with this particular project, I see tons of people directly impacted in a positive way in many, many, many medical facets where using a regular medication is a problem and now they can eat a chocolate and completely have none of the negative effects that they were diagnosed with weeks prior or months prior. Um, and uh, so to me, kind of reinforcing the goodwill through what we're doing and also seeing a direct medical benefit to people is just insane. So I think what drives me is the outcome of things. And so I don't try to stack as much work and effort on the beginning, hoping for a certain outcome. I go exactly where the problem is, hoping to push whatever I can to help make the outcome for that group and or whatever exists. And so for me, it's it, it's about the direct benefits of, for others. I think that at the end of the day, that really draw me to it. Cool. 
So what kind of benefits can people get from um, either THC or CBDs? Tons. Uh, and now we're learning uh, as more scientists are allowed in and, and crazy farmers as well are becoming closer to scientists. We're learning there's tons more compounds as well in cannabis that um, are very helpful, but particularly the two you mentioned, THC and CBD, are the, the ones we've studied the most. Um, on the THC side, you have a lot of people with uh, uh, appetite problems or uh, anxiety issues, things where maybe their nerves um, or other uh, not not real mental issues. This isn't necessarily a solution for uh, like serious mental behavioral issues, but for uh, like brain damage or like nerve damage or things that physically calming your body, relaxing your muscles or um, kind of easing your brain from being uh, constantly working on mitigating pain. If let's say you have a major issue in, in one of your legs and it just causes you joint pain like crazy, THC is really good at alleviating, alleviating that pain because it will relieve the actual joints and the, relax the muscles, the tendons, and so physically it helps in that way, but at the same time it gives your brain a relaxing break from all the constant work that it has to do internally to try to help heal you naturally. And so THC is a really a major health benefit when you're talking about pain or when you're talking about physical problems, and CBD is quite to the opposite. Um, helps with more, uh, so far it's, it's heavier medical issues like epilepsy or, um, particularly nerve damage itself, like a real nerve damage, uh, that needs something, some additional stimulant to support. Uh, if it may take six months or a year to heal CBD can rapidly increase your own body's natural ability to fix that problem. So where it's not like THC, where it's much more a quick kind of uh, temporary kind of, not sedative, but uh, calming effect, CBD is a much more regenerative, rejuvenative, um, uh, cellular, at a cellular level or at a, a much more kind of internal body working level um, helps with a lot of those real medical issues. So particularly we have people who use CBD that are, have arthritis or other um, kind of really long-term effects that they're dealing with. They include THC as well when the pain gets particularly too high, um, but the CBD helps over the long-term for their body to kind of naturally fight this ongoing issue that they have. So that's a, a decent breakdown, hopefully, of the two. Cool. Um, so I realized we're missing like just like you just explaining simply and quickly like what Rossum is and what you do. So just in the form of like, you know, Rossum is a company that makes CBD and THC chocolates. You're like, I, sure. make, I make chocolate that has blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. So, um, so what is, what do you do or what does Rossum do? So Rossum uh, is a chocolate company. Uh, we make really, really, really simple premium chocolates. Uh, we care about the ingredients. Every single ingredient that goes in is something that we've tested many, many options and know exactly why it's there. And we infuse it with the purest, simplest THC or CBD distillates that we can find to make what we believe to be the most uh, healthy and uh, comfortable edible product to eat. Anybody like anybody who likes chocolate might like our product. Um, it's a pretty decent flavor that's not too extreme. Um, it has great chocolate flavor that a lot of other people who care more about quantity over quality are just terrible chocolate. Um, so I think I like to think of us first and foremost as people who care about the quality of our product, not the fact that we're a cannabis company or the fact that we're a chocolate edible company or any of the little facets. It's we're a product company and that we happen to make chocolate edibles right now that are premium and, and super, super high quality. Great. All right, let's reframe so that we can cool. cut back and forth, maybe just... Make sure you get like a really flat shot for the flat earth question. <laughs> Can we use a wide angle for that one? Or can we use a fisheye for that one? Dude, I want to I wanna incorporate some of these maps you've showed me. You want to hear something weird? 
Yeah. One of the maps was created by Ferguson Orlando. Who's, who's Ferguson Orlando? I don't know. He's just a dude. Uh, it's an interesting name, though. It is an interesting name. Here, I'm, I'm going to go back over there. So Maybe it was Ferguson. Maybe it was Orlando Ferguson. I don't remember. Orlando Ferguson. It's one of those two. Was that a modern map? Or is no, it like a 1900 or 18, no, 1800s map. Um, Alright, where was I Where was I going next? So who's your customer base for Rossum? So Rossum currently uh, works with predominantly elderly people who have um, physical problems like back problems or shoulder problems or uh, currently use acupressurists or acupuncture as well as uh, masseuse a lot of the time. They've now adopted adding CBD chocolates um, and some small doses of THC to their regimen on top of the body work um, as a means of really relaxing and relieving some of the, the ailments that some of these people. So I'd say a lot of our user base at this point is people um, definitely older people, let's say 65 plus probably, um, that are de-using it for either short-term pain or long-term uh, yeah, illnesses that they have, mostly physical illnesses. Cool. So what's the advantage of edibles over just smoking marijuana? Um, it's debatable. There's a lot of people uh, in the world who claim that they've been smoking marijuana their entire life and have awesome x-rays and different things that show they look healthy and don't have crazy build up in their lungs or any of these weird things that we think might happen however i haven't personally really pushed too hard into learning what long 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 term effects of smoking do because um i'm a big <laughs> proponent or pusher for the the edible side um i think edibles whether they're healthier or not, that's it, it is a debate. I really do think that we can talk about it long term and never get to a final solution. But the interesting thing is an edible is so much more discreet. An edible is so much more consistent. An edible has the potential to be used in multiple uh, doses where, let's say, if you're walking around with like a, a joint, it's significantly harder to piece out into four sittings or eight sittings where a chocolate, you absolutely can chop it up into small pieces and, and can control what you're trying to control much more uh, consistently. So I think that those are real perks of edibles as well as um, a lot of people don't like the idea of smoking. It really just, it seems to be a, either, a, they believe it to be unhealthy or it's kind of a burden, just it's extra work um, having to go outside, especially if they use cannabis for uh, something at the workplace, but let's say people are using CBD for epilepsy treatment and they dose two or three times throughout the day. Um, you can take a tincture or a chocolate to work, uh, but taking a smoke break to walk outside and smoke joint is not necessarily looked at or available at all times. So I think an edible is really an alternative and we're just finding more and more reasons why it's beneficial from a form factor standpoint. It's really just so much more beneficial there. Um, but from a health standpoint, I really think there's a lot of discussion um, that can go into the other. Sure. Um, all right, so shifting gears a little bit, I understand that you believe... All right, what, what shape is the earth, Andrew? I don't know what shape the earth is in the grand scheme of everything, but I do believe that the portion of the earth that we modern humans co-inhabit um, is not a sphere, is not a round ball, but much more a flat disc uh, in shape. Uh, what, what is beyond the, the rim of that disc doesn't fall off into nothingness. There's an ice ring around this disc. So I can't tell you what goes on beyond the ice. Um, I've never discovered it or explored it or had an opportunity to take uh, self-discovery or self-guided tours of Antarctica. Uh, one day, maybe I will. So just, just to be clear, you believe that Antarctica is what? Antarctica is a ring 
uh, of ice, essentially an, an ice wall around the disc that we currently live on. All right. So how did you how did you come to believe this? Um. <laughs> Ultimately, I started to question a lot of the other things that my entire life I've just taken simply as fact. Um, nowadays, it's very easy to read a blog title as a mature adult and say, ha, clearly that's not the whole story, or clearly that's not what they mean, or like clearly a lot of the buzzwords and advertising out there around media and, and information is not 100% face value. So. I, I grew up thinking I could decipher the difference, no problem. I could still read the article, even though the title or a little of what they say might be a little wonky, there's still probably some nuggets of information in there that's good. So I built my belief system like everyone else, using what was told to me in the education system as well as using um, my intelligence. Um, <laughs> and I believed that I had a great picture of how everything worked and, and uh, yeah, I was definitely a person who thought they were smart. Um, however, several months ago, after uh, hearing some interesting claims about NASA uh, faking imagery, I started to look into it, and I started to really kind of wonder if if it was possible. That seems so ridiculous to me. At the same time, not only are some of the brightest engineers in the world that we are aware of or told publicly, not only do they exist there and work there, but they get so much funding and so much other industry is based on what they discover. The idea that they could be wrong or lying on purpose both seemed far-fetched to me. So I was like, this is silly. I'm going to go disprove this new idea that just popped into my world um, via the internet and I'm going to go disprove this imagery thing. And uh, two and a, <coughs> excuse me, two and a half months later, I still had yet to disprove this NASA imagery fake stuff. and in researching more and more had discovered how many other things NASA has been lying about um, from their inception. Uh, and basically that was my first big hurrah into this side was understanding the lies that NASA has been putting out in front of us under our, I mean, just in plain sight, but we choose to let very, very, very quote, in my opinion, silly and complicated sounding science and our wanting to understand it, we convince ourselves that we get it. I understand that. I read an article about it. I know what a quark is. Don't tell me I, you don't know what a quark I mean, I'll explain it to you. I write an article on it. Like, here's how you can calculate. And it's like people that don't actually study this or know what they're doing are experts on all these subjects. Yet, whenever I talk about flat earth or think about flat earth, the people are constantly berated, constant. It's not an open topic of conversation or exploration. It's just silly nonsense. And so to me, it was like, this is the first time in my life I had ever uncovered on my, what I believe to be my own accord, the, all of the other lies that NASA, in my opinion, has put out, such as like faking the, the space station, faking so many other uh, space events and rocket launches and things that they've made spectacles, broadcast it on the news, put it in papers, convince everybody it's awesome, and then when the government gives them billions of dollars, we all say, well, hopefully one day we're gonna benefit from the technology that they're making today. So I was under that whole mindset until I realized how many lies, I believe lies have been put out in front of us because of my research in that field, and now, in learning that that was a lie, I wanted to, to know what the truth was and who else knew these lies existed. And in finding the groups who discuss those lies, I found the people who also talk about a lot of real science from other scientists that I've never studied in my life that points towards the flat earth. It's not a new idea. It's been around for a long time. Everybody jokes about it in elementary school. They say like, I mean, it's one of the first things you learn is like, people used to think the world was flat. Ha, were they going to fall off the edge? Ah, ha, 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 And everybody at age whatever, super young, immediately goes, ha, 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 and becomes a, a preacher of this mindset that if you think the earth is flat, you're a fucking idiot. And uh, so, I mean, my seven-year-old niece would tell me right now that, that I'm dumb if I told her that the earth was flat. And 
She's never, she doesn't like, that's, that's insane to me that she would have that strong of an opinion about something. So clearly there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there about the subject, as well as a ton of lies from the biggest people we pay to teach us in that realm. And those two things combined solidified a lot of this for me. And at least so far, I have not found contradictions on that side of the fence that are in any way comparable to the to the contradictions and problems on the round earth side. So what you mentioned other things that NASA is lying about. So what, do you have some examples? Well, like uh, uh, here, here's a funny example. Um, recently, Angry Birds came out uh, with a game called Angry Birds in Space. And uh, the International Space Station happened to have an Angry Birds space pig on the space station <laughs> in space so that they could do an advertisement with Rovio for Angry Birds in Space. So we have a NASA co-branded advertisement with a cell phone, a privately owned cell phone video game. And I don't know what the calculations are, but it's on NASA's website at the moment. They talk about how much thousands of dollars it takes per pound of anything to send on a rocket. So it's thousands of dollars. So the idea that they spent seven or 10 or 12 thousands of dollars and allowed Rovio to send a pig as part of their limited capacity to me seems super irresponsible for a world-class space organization that just seems like two people that shouldn't play. Um, and at the same time, uh, they've shown some really, really silly physics. Uh, like the thing is Angry Birds is a slingshot where you pull back and you launch a bird at things. So he's got a slingshot on the space station in zero G's shooting a bird through the International Space Station. And it's this whole fun joke. Well, there's a scene in this great YouTube video um, put out by NASA where he holds up an egg and says, here I have some eggs. And he pulls out three eggs as part of this commercial. And then he literally says, but don't ask me how I got eggs in space. And then he goes right back to continuing his commercial. And the idea of physically having an egg in space is dumb. It, 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 it's super dumb. We, would, we cannot do that. You can look on NASA stuff. Everything's powdered. We don't send that kind of stuff to space. Nobody does. Nobody ever has. Nobody would. Nobody will. Yet, here we have it. On the International Space Station, through a NASA official video, and the guy's doing it for an Angry Birds commercial. So clearly the people who care to watch this commercial don't care about the physics of an egg in space and don't care that this guy literally told the camera, don't question this, and then continued. Like, any scientist is going to look at that and go, yeah, that wasn't in space. Right away, because they understand that that's just silly to consider. And so the idea that they're pushing those ideas all the time, everywhere, by filming things on Earth and convincing us that people are in space is just rehashing a lot of these same ideas and convincing us every time we see somebody in zero G, we imagine, oh man, space, it's weightless. However, zero G is a formation or a flying pattern with a regular airplane on Earth, like in our regular atmosphere. Like you can go to Los Angeles, California and book a flight on zero G airline and fly and you'll go through multiple cycles where they do this with the airplane. And while you're falling in that time where you're going to zero to from up to down with no transition, you're free form or free fall. And so zero G is simply being on an airplane going in a certain pattern in the air. So I've seen footage, many, many things of like behind the scene footage of a zero G shot where they have astronauts in full gear in the plane on zero G with like zero G employees and stuff. And then you're like, okay, why is NASA shooting in zero G on earth through a private plane company if they got astronauts in space? It's really silly. And I'll say the last thing too is uh, there's a lot of pools used for spacewalks. They uh, train underwater. Um, however, there's a lot of great footage shown 
of real spacewalks that they say are real spacewalks where you can still see a couple of bubbles trail from the astronauts from time to time. Like they're very, very hidden and they're very particular, but you can absolutely, there's several scenes you can clearly see bubbles leave or leave like, like a door. Um, somebody will open a door and it'll automatically close. And in space, there would be no force to have closed the door. So there's 0% chance that that door closed on the moon or wherever they were. Yet here we're watching a video and NASA's got their little emblem on the bottom and whoever, astronaut, blah, 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 blah. And everybody's like, woo, look at his cool space suit. Look at his cool hat. Ah, and it's just a silly video and everybody's like cool with the billions we're spending. Do you have any questions you want to ask him? I know you're. I know you're really curious about the flat Earth theory. <laughs> yeah, I don't think. I don't think so. All right. So what's. So what's the evidence? Like, make the case. Why. Like, I'm. I'm not currently, a pusher of the flat Earth theory. I'm a pusher of the fact that the round Earth theory is not happening. It doesn't make sense. There's so much math against it. Uh, there's so many things that, that world organizations that say they have the proof, people who should have the ability to prove something, to make this a concrete fact. These people still to this day have discrepancies amongst each other. There's still room for error. They're still constantly tweaking and updating the ideas. So I'm more interested in helping people understand that that whole system is a complete lie so that we can start spending our resources thinking about what's the real system. And I believe with a little bit of research that a lot of these other people who have been doing this a lot longer than I have, they've come up with the flat earth as the best possible way. And they've created the same types of 3D models that the round earth uses, like Google Earth generates a sphere out of data. They generate their model out of the same data and almost everything works identically. Physics works the same distances, times, all kind of things work the same. Um, so it's not necessarily that the flat earth, I'm like, I have proof it's a flat earth, but I have proof that the flat earth model works equally as well or better than the round earth model. And I have proof that the round earth model is full of lies. So what's, all right, so what's the proof that the round earth model is full of lies then? Um, curvature is the easiest thing to test. Um, the whole concept of curvature says, uh, basically there should be a certain amount of distance of earth between me and another fixed point, a certain distance away. So, um, I'll give you an example from the math. And that is if somebody's eye height is at six foot, a person whose eye height is six foot standing six miles away should only be able to see anything over six foot on the other person. The six, their eyes and below the entire six feet should be hidden. Um, and that changes based on the distance based and based on the eye height. I'm just giving a specific example of two six foot high people at six meet, or six miles away. But the idea there is clearly there's been many photos taken very, very easily through telescopes of objects that are six miles away and they can see the whole object. There is no for sure difference of at some point the earth rises between me and that object to hide the base of it a certain distance. Basically the horizon should be halfway between me and the object and that would be uh, at that a calculatable distance. So there's just plenty of of documented photographic proofs that show that if the curvature existed for a curved earth in the way that they tell us at the numbers that they tell us that we should not be able to see many things that we can see. And there's been a lot of inventions created to try to mask this with uh, refraction and, and reflection. And, um, people talk about, uh, atmospheric uh, disbursement and I don't know, there's a bunch of dumb words and, and these are real things. Refraction is a real thing. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. 
However, there's plenty of photographic evidence that shows where the bands of refraction are, where the bands of reflection are. And you can show based on the day that those bands expand and, and contract based on the heat. It's simple. Um, at the hotter the day gets, the, the higher the band of, uh, of heat on top of the water. So you can actually see the mirage effect on a long distance over the ocean, you can see the mirage effect grow and contract based on the heat. So people that take a single still photo are often attacked and say like, look, no, there's mirage and there's this and there's that and fine. But when we now we are using video so we can help educate these people on the idea that yes, there is refraction in play in this photograph. Yes, there is other things. However, that still doesn't override the idea that this entire object we're looking at should be hidden. Um, and then now there's people who do discuss too that somehow refraction will bring an object. So you have a curved earth and you have like a building over here and I'm standing on a building over here. They're saying that somehow refraction will bring the building up and angle it to orient it perfectly for me. So it'll be basically like I'm on a flat earth, but I'm really on a curved earth with a nice lens effect. Um, and to me, that's just very silly to say like, oh yeah, I know it all works out with plain, simple science on your side, but don't worry, we got complicated science over here that makes it sense. So just come over here. And mentally, I'm like, why would you not at least consider the simple side? Like, why not at least like do that math and say, is there a place I can go where I can look at something six miles away? And the easiest thing is to be on a beach if you have access to a beach, um, because then one person can be can be at sea level and another person can be further down the beach, the same beach, but at sea level so that you both know how high you are and you can really accurately know what you should expect based on the calculatable math. Um, and, or you can go on YouTube and Google and see a ton of stuff that in my opinion is valid proof um, because it simply uses optical glass telescopes as well as um, just simple cameras to show, we can show things at a long distance and um, it's just, it's very simple for me because you can prove people, prove to people with photos and, and telescopes, very, very simple. All right. Um, do you think, is there any relationship between your business and your belief system? I mean, you were, okay, so when you first started Rossum, you didn't believe that, you believed that the earth was round. I did, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you came, you came across these ideas like as you've been working with Rossum. Definitely. So did you, was there anything that changed about the way that you run your business or the way that your lifestyle interacts with your business once you came across this belief? I don't think so directly. Um, uh, I think I, I definitely had to win David's heart back. Uh, I think I scared him really hard whenever I started talking about a bunch of weird stuff. And had to let him know that the business is fine. I'm not one of those guys who's just going to be crazy in his room and, and never work and never do anything ever again, you know, and leave people hanging. I, I know a lot of the stereotype for eccentric people who believe, very heavily believe different ideas to the point where they spend their life or spend time in their life actively working on those ideas rather than just doing mundane things um, are often looked at as people who have gone off the deep end. And to me, it makes sense because it's, it's culture in, encourages people to fall into the river. So everyone standing on the side is your friends floating down the river are just yelling at you like, hey, like the river's awesome. We're floating, man. Come on. Like you're going to miss the chance to be in the river with us. Get in the river. We're drinking. We're having a good time. We're doing our thing. But I'm like, no, I got a lot of stuff to do up here on this side. So um, I think if, it's just the personal aspect that really me trying to relate to my world again trying to, to fit in and also trying to, to rebuild kind of the personal relationships around me in a way that doesn't scare people or that doesn't, my intention is not to push my beliefs or push my intentions. I'm learning. That's it. I want to learn and I want to talk about what I'm learning. Like any other subject I ever learned, I want to talk about it with people who are interested in talking about it around me. So I think really just establishing boundaries with with what we discuss and whatnot is really all that's affected the business. Just making sure that we have good boundaries as to, to yeah, what's important to work on and whatnot. But um, I don't think that the actual business itself uh, has been affected really. Um, yeah, 
I, I, I hope not. <laughs> I don't, if there's a negative impact, it will be, uh, it would be more like an individual action, not the ideas itself. So when we were when we were interviewing David over here, he said, "I don't something. I mean, I'm I'm paraphrasing now, and if if I get the idea wrong, let me know. But it was something along the lines of, um, like, there's nothing we can do about this. Like, there's no there's no action I can take in my life based on this belief. So it's not worth thinking about. So what's your what's your response to that?" Um. I think for me, uh, honesty is comfort. When I trust my surroundings, then I'm comfortable. If I don't trust my surroundings, I don't think there's a way to be comfortable, no matter what. I can't build a, a shelter for myself in a world that I'm not comfortable in because I'll fear going outside or whatever. It just won't, the, goal, the right answer is not to, to kind of shelter myself in. Um, <coughs> so... We paraphrase again what he said. Um, basically, and, and correct me if if I'm misrepresenting you, David, but it was basically that there's no like there's no tangible actions or there's no like inherent yeah. next steps kind of thing. Like if there is this big conspiracy to convince us the world is round when it's not actually round, there's nothing we can do about that. Basically, I guess I have personally I have nothing to gain, but I think it's important to. This has drawn me to preach two messages. I don't like to be a preacher. I don't find that that's my goal, but I do find that I talk a lot and people like to ask me questions and stuff. So I do find that I, I try to really believe what I talk about and care about what I'm talking about both so that when I find myself in these situations that I do frequently, I'm genuine and that's what matters to me. Um, but like, I, if there's no tangible steps, to me, that means you haven't learned enough yet um, in anything. If you want to climb a rock climbing wall, you, first thing is not to go to the wall. Uh, you're going to get there and go, oh, am I wearing shoes that are okay? Uh, do I need anything? Uh, it, you have no concept of what you're doing. So the idea is you got to figure out what's in, involved. What are the, the, the ingredients or whatever. And once you kind of have your stage and your your ideas, then you can decide, am I ready to take an action or am I, do I need to go learn a, a detailed skill or, and, and you kind of just, it's, it's all an agile process. And so for me, I can't convince anybody of anything until I have proof. My proof is not good enough. The whole concept, the whole lie is such a big concept, a big idea that no photo or video or individual concept is going to convince somebody. I can't make a trifold board like a school science fair and be like, look, the earth, you know, and people are going to walk by like they did in school and say, awesome, check it out, look at that, it's real. They're going to look by me and say, oh, this is dumb. So there, I realize there's no individual action that can be made, but what I can do is twofold. One, I can encourage people to spend some time questioning things around them and trying to make their understanding of their world more sophisticated. That way they feel more comfortable because I just assume that's how all humans are and everyone that I've talked to about this for the most part agrees. Um, so I, I think that that's important in encouraging people to, um, to explore again, to try things and, and learn new things. Um, but at the same time, if a person's being lied to, it's uncomfortable for them. If a person's being lied to and their friends know it, there's this weird internal debate these days in our culture that people are like, should we tell them? Should we not? Should we interfere? Should we not? Like, it's our responsibility now because we have the secrets, not based on the reality of what, who's getting hurt in this secret or what's actually happening. So I think that's a big part of how the system works, is those who actually really learn what's going on, the majority find some power there. They find either inherent ways to exploit others who haven't understood a lot of these very, very kind of well-hidden secrets, or they find the people who are already working to conceal these secrets and find jobs there. And those jobs pay well, and those jobs are very particular. Um, so I think that what we can do is convince people that to look and see the lies that exist in places that they see honesty right now. 
um, stop trusting things so much. And we finally got there with media and journalism where people, even though we still have people who want to watch a particular news outlet day in, day out, just to be that really, really like crappy person, the majority of people at least understand that a lot of media is biased automatically by default before it really happens. And we'll get to the understanding that many other facets of the world around us are also very, very biased before we even realize, before we even see it. And we'll have to have that moment where we realize, I realize I'm not a Fox News guy myself, but when it comes to X, I'm being a Fox Newser. And you have to recognize that being right is not the right answer, but understanding more can't hurt you. There's no way learning can hurt you. So for me, there's a lot of fear for people to explore this. So I have to help encourage them to know they're being lied to. That's a motivation to want to do it and to know that there is something out there to find, at least so far. And that's also hopefully some level of, of encouragement or motivation. But there's yeah, definitely no way to, to lay it out for somebody. For me, I had to literally spend three or four months studying. Um, it started as about two months, two and a half months. Um, and now I'm about three or four months of total time, full time, like researching, like watching videos. And a lot of it's dumb stuff. <laughs> You're watching somebody whose purpose is to distract you and who's, who's making money on ads. So they're just saying whatever dumb stuff people want to hear. And most of their videos bogus. And it's not a, let's look for the nuggets of good stuff in there. It's let's start to figure out who the actual sources of information that we can trust are. And then let's start to dive deep into those sources. Um, and that's what is difficult and why uh, I think it's so important to push. Because it does take a lot of depth to, to figure it out, to, to get there. You really have to like rabbit holes for a little while to see the rabbit hole network. Okay, pots the well. I think we need to like raise the curtain up a little bit because it's getting dark. Yeah, I mean, I think we're I think we're actually done, really. Okay, we're... I have a question. Yeah. Okay. okay, so you mentioned like some other people know what's go really going on, like like except from besides from um, Nisa, you just mentioned what other organizations or occupations you think are involved in this. It, that's too much, Andy. Okay, wait. Um, you have to walk it like a little, go little by little. That thing's not falling. I've totally done this before. This one, for whatever reason, though, it sucks. It's, it's left. Here you go. Yep. I think I'm right, mine. Tell me mine. You are like, I can't see him actually <laughs> in the camera. I, yeah, I think we're good. All right. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yep. All right, wait, you, you probably want to, I think your question was just what other organizations yeah. are involved besides NASA? Yeah. All right, back to you. Cool. So uh, I think there's a lot of organizations involved. Um, I mean, basically, you can look at the top of any of them. Whoever's funded by a major government for a large portion of money that if you really polled the population and said, like, is this organization supporting you or in any way doing something that's directly going to help your life? And the answer is no. They're probably part of this system um, inherently. But, I mean, definitely the JPL and the Russian Space Organization and the Japanese Space Organization, and NASA, all of them work together, are, are part of the same network. And, and in my opinion, it's all theatrics. There's no real competitions here. There's no real um, advanced technologies that are being... Uh, kind of covertly looked at back and forth. And there, I don't think there's a lot of espionage between those organizations, particularly. Um, I believe those organizations work together and have a lot of communal resources. Uh, and maybe most of the engineers that work there do not know and are not aware, but the mass agenda that as to what they're going to focus on for the next X phase of their existence is worked on by a group of uh, insiders at all of those organizations that run and are in particular key places in those organizations to make sure that the agenda is followed and 
and make sure everything works the way it does. But for fakery and information out there, you can look anywhere. You can look on any of the major organizations and then also look at the restrictions. Um, look, at, look at restrictions on going to Antarctica or restrictions on going to the North Pole and, and or restrictions on going to space and then see who is your guide. See what channels, what avenues you actually have to obtain going to one of these places and you'll start to see really quickly that they're all very closely related and the people who run the organizations are heavily, heavily interchangeable amongst the top. What's what's the JPL? The uh, uh, something planet something I don't even know. It's NASA's it's NASA's educational wing. Like they have a something planetary league. Something I don't remember. Um, but it's like the World Planet Organization that's co-founded by NASA. Um, another major world organization. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, and uh, also, quite for the record, the, the UN logo is a flat Earth map, um, like, to the T, the, the most commonly looked at 2D representation of the flat Earth is the layout used in the UN logo and many other international and space organization logos, uh, many of them, dozens of them across the world. So if you ask why they use these maps or sometimes they put on their website in, like, the FAQ, um, and they'll say things like, oh, we think it looks good, or this map was used for some very particular purpose at some very particular time for somebody who just liked it, or like our founder, his grandpa made this map, or whatever, but they're, they all have cute stories, but the real answer is that it's the, the world, that's <laughs> the map of what we live on, in plain sight, making sure everybody's aware that we're, we're not aware as a whole, however... Nobody's really hiding it from us. We're just distracted. All right. Uh, is there anything we didn't get to cover that you'd like to talk about? No, I think uh, I think that's about it. Yeah. All right. Cool, man. Well, thanks a lot. Woo! Wasn't it? Uh, that was fun, right? Yeah, totally.